trans guys being here, they go, they, they take, make these videos and I think they're just, you know, I totally appreciate what they're doing. So thank you very, very much to Free Electrons for the videotaping of these sessions. That's really terrific. Yeah, they deserve it. Yeah. Um, I know because I make use of them by saying, hey, just watch the, in fact, today I'll show you some things based on some of their videos. So um, I, I'm David Stewart. Uh, I uh, manage some engineers uh, in uh, the Octo Project, and I'm also a member of the Octo Project Advisory Board. I really appreciate your being here. What we're going to try to do in, in the talk today is um, give you kind of uh, the ability to walk out of here and be able to, you know, take these slides and actually get started building your own Linux system from source. And so that's what I want to try and give you enough um, idea of how this thing works so that you could actually step away and, and do that. And uh, um, But I also want to give you a little bit of an idea of what's new. We just released a new version and uh, give you an idea of a few of those features, what they're, what they're about. And I also, I guess I can't even talk about how the thing works without giving you an idea of, you know, kind of why you should be interested. So I'm hoping I'll, I'll give you a little bit of uh, that kind of idea as well. And I think I just said those things in reverse order. So I'm actually going to start about why you should maybe care, and then we'll, we'll show you how it works. So uh, uh, anything else someone wants me to cover? Is this good? Okay. Anything else? This is good? All right, we'll start here. All right. So, um, you know, the story with the Octo Project was really a, an observation that said embedded Linux, for, for me, it's like a little bit like servers was maybe 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when it's like 15 years ago, some people would just roll their own server OS or some a few people would be using Red Hat or something like that. And there's just all kinds of, um, it, very difficult to work in an environment like that because there's all sorts of different things going on. I think embedded Linux is kind of like that, where there's like 80% of Linux and embedded is sort of roll your own as opposed to, you know, things that are coming out of some, you know, OSV or something. So it's like a, a, a kind of a, a, a very creative environment, but it's also very difficult sometimes to, uh, you know, get started. What build system do I use? Do I just, you know, rip apart Ubuntu and start of, you know, throwing stuff out till I get down to the size that I need? And, and it's very difficult to do that sort of thing. So, um, but, but obviously uh, Linux is growing and embedded because, well, hey, it's, it's free and you can get the source code. So that, all of those things are very positive. So some industry leaders really came together to try to help, you know, sort some of this stuff out and came out with the Octo project really to solve these, these basic problems. Let's, there's no reason to fight over the versions of the grep command, you know, let's, let's just kind of get, you know, some of the things like the build system and, and common packages kind of, you know, uh, to the place where we're all, all right, we're all sort of working on this BSP formats, things of that sort. Let's just kind of all, you know, kind of subtle on those things. And so people can do, uh, spend their time time on, you know, adding software features that are, are useful or, or the chip guys can compete on the chip features and things like that as opposed to build systems and that sort of thing. That's that's the basic idea. So the industry has is, is kind of come together to, you know, work on this sort of thing and, you know, ultimately so Linux will grow more and embed it. That's, that's the basic idea. So what is it? Uh, so these are the basic pieces of the Octo project. It is not a, um, it, it, it allows you to build a distribution. It's not actually a, a, yet another Linux distribution. It's not that. It lets you build your own custom Linux distribution for your embedded project. And um, supports four architectures, uh, ARM, uh, PowerPC, MIPS, and x86. Um, x86 in 32 and 64-bit flavors. Um, it is an open source project with a strong community. Actually, our 1.1 release had, uh, I think we counted up 72 uh, separate, you know, uh, contributors who were contributing code. And there are various people like me and various others, uh, like I see Nithya here in the room, we're not contributing code, but we're spending all of our time on the project. So there are other people as well. So, uh, um, and uh, the content is, uh, of the system is, it's it's a complete Linux OS with, uh, the, with package metadata. So what you get when you download the Octo project is, um, essentially, met, uh, build system and metadata. And the metadata just gives you, uh, you know, kind of where to find the sources, how to build them, and uh, patches. And that uh, allows you to build a complete Linux system. It pulls all of the sources from, you know, uh, wherever in the internet they happen to be. We have uh, every six month release, so we have a regular heartbeat. It's been April and October. Uh, we're now at our 1.1 release, which is sort of our third release. Uh, and uh, you know, really, what we do is every six months we uh, do uh, you know update to the latest stable uh, release kernel, tool chain, and packages, and uh, also some you know feature improvements as we go forward. Um, and uh, so it's also a place that common place where the industry can uh, put BSPs. 
You know, so you can go to one place to get them. You don't have to go there. That's not mandated, but it's one place you can go that's kind of convenient. And there's also application development tools. This really says, okay, besides developing the operating system, you need to develop tools. Jessica Jong this morning gave a great talk about our Eclipse-based uh, plugin. So you can either use Eclipse or not. There's there's command line uh, oriented version or plug into Eclipse. Um, and then full documentation. I've got a full-time uh, tech writer working on, and in fact, the 1.1 release has a a, a brand new developer's guide that really tries to, you know, kind of take all of this stuff and, and make it kind of a coherent sort of thing. So, um, anyway, some people don't care about documentation. Maybe coming to this conference, you maybe don't care about documentation, but it is something that's there in, in case you do. Um, so why should you as a developer care? I always sort of figure the people coming to this conference are probably developers, and so, you know, why should you care? I mean, one of the cool things is you can build a complete Linux system from sources in about an hour. Um, that's actually pretty cool. I mean, uh, now there's a few caveats, maybe 90 minutes if you want to build X. Um, I remember being at a, a meeting a few months ago where I think uh, somebody was complaining that, oh, to rebuild all of glibc takes, you know, can take hours, and it's like, well, I can build the glibc plus all the tools in a cross-build environment, plus the kernel and the entire user land, um, you know, in about an hour. Now it's a well-configured uh, system. It's a desktop system, but, you know, I, and I'm using a lot of parallelism there for sure. Um, but that's actually pretty cool. Um, now you may wonder why I might want to go from sources as opposed to just using a binary distribution of some sort. Well, you know, a lot of times to get the kind of optimizations you want from the compiler, the exact op optimizations you want, you, you need source. And so you just need to be able to, to you know, to get exactly what you wanted embedded, and this is how to get there. Um, it's a validated collection of packages, which includes tool chain, kernel, and user space. Um, we have, uh, you know, essentially you can pick a, a footprint footprint size, like a minimal footprint, uh, one that is configured with X and, the, you know, a few, uh, you know, things like that, or one that's, you know, could be LSB compliant. So it's like you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, it's a small, medium, and just right. Um, Let's see, great collection of application developer tools. Primarily, it's an upstream-focused project, so, you know, we pull in a lot of things from upstream. So if there's stuff that's available, best practices, sources, et cetera, from upstream, it's a very much an upstream-focused project. Um, and I try very much with the engineers that work for me, at least, to make a major uh, criteria for them to upstream pa uh, patches. So as much as possible, if the project is uh, maintained, um, we want to try and uh, upstream patches as much as possible. So um, uh, not to have have them just sort of lost in this project someplace. Uh, you know, supporting all these major architectures, um, the cool thing about this is if I want to switch from, in many cases, if I want to switch from like ARM to x86, it's a one-line change in a configuration file. Well, that's pretty cool, you know? It's like you could change one line and all the cross tools rebuild and, you know, all the packages rebuild and, and you're done. So that's actually, we actually did this a few times, I remember a year ago at ELC, um, E ELC in Cambridge a year ago, we had a bunch of demos that we were putting together that was a cross-architecture thing, and some people didn't have the, you know, the other architecture that they were developing their piece on. And we came together in a hotel room, and just people just changed the one line, and now they have the, you know, the thing working on the other architecture. So it's it's high degree of portability. That's another goal there. Uh, and then a, an easy path to commercial, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Wind River, uh, Linux, uh, Mentor Graphics, uh, Monta Vista, etc. The whole idea is if you choose to have an OSV involved, um, we don't want to have to have them spend a whole bunch of time changing the, you know, the build system or anything like that. It's just uh, the idea is they, they can then add services and extra packages and features on top of that. So we think this is some really good stuff for that, that embedded developers will, will really care about. And it's a phenomenal um, collaboration of different uh, players. So it's, uh, you know, it's, you, you know I, I don't have the wall of logos here. I have those, you know, out of the booth. But, you know, uh, from I very much appreciated some of the things from uh, recently TI, Mentor Graphics, Monta Vista, you know, Freescale has really been getting involved. I'm going to miss somebody, I'm sure. There's a lot of independent people that are not connected to a big company. Uh, we've been uh, really... Uh, privilege to get some some great um, individual uh, people contributing as well. So it's a good you know kind of collaboration of a lot of different um, you know people working together. So what's new? Uh, there's a couple of pieces here, and also I, I want to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're working on next. But what's available now? The bits you have available now. One is Hob. Hob is a. Um, if you're wondering whether it stands for something, it, it doesn't really stand for anything. It's uh, in uh, Britain. The the guy who developed this is from uh, England, and I guess in England, uh, anyone here from England? 
Okay, so in a, uh, what we in the in the in, in the states, what we call a cooktop, I think they call a hob there, you know, and we have this sort of cooking analogy because bit bake is the thing which you know, and we have recipes, and so I think that's kind of continuing the cooking metaphor. So it's just it's it doesn't actually stand for anything other than the you know, it's the hob. It's basically a, a, a you know a graphical interface. So for pe some people, you know, really want to get into the intricacies of you know configuring things exactly in terms of you know whatever text file is in there. Some people just want to use the thing to get a you know a thing you know to basically get a system going and so this very much allows you to you know change packages uh, change a configuration etc without having to dive into a configuration file so it's so we're going to put more into this I mean we what we've got I think works but I think um, one of the things I'm, I'm very intrigued about is people who don't live the the Linux lifestyle you know they maybe don't use the latest you know distro on their desktop uh, unimaginable as that may be, there's some people who want to build Linux systems who aren't, you know, sort of living Linux every day. For those folks, I want to try and create something. Uh, we're talking about maybe just having a complete sort of build appliance that would run to, uh, independent of what operating system you have, and then uh, it would boot straight up into the this UI and allow you to, you know, not have to, you know, mess with things under the cover. So I know probably nobody in this room cares about that, but for some people who are not in this room, who I'd love to ha make, you know, Yocta really work for them. Those are some of the people I really want to try to make this work for. Um, Multilib is a it was hard. <laughs> this is a very hard feature to do, so I'm really delighted that it's, it's it's in there. We've been working on it for a while. It basically lets you choose on a per uh, package basis whether you know which libraries to use. So you can build in a 64 in a 32-bit system. You can you can build some that are 64-bit, for example, right? So if there's only one or two applications you really want to run 64-bit, so you can pick the li basically the architecture you can tune for based on you know on a per package basis. So that's pretty. That, that's pretty powerful. Not just for x86, but there's some other architectures that need that as well. Um, we also have initial support for uh, x80, uh, uh, x32. This is the, some of the Intel guys have been working on this. This basically allows you to have um, to use the 64-bit registers without having the 64-bit uh, data uh, and immediates and uh, uh, things of that sort. So you can actually reduce the footprint, reduce the I cache and D cache pressure, but you get all the 64-bit registers. Um, this is sort of an emerging kind of way of, of uh, you know working with x86 and I think it's it, it's pretty powerful and then in Eclipse the other big big piece is that um, you know for Eclipse we had it set up really well for application developers we still do but now uh, uh, Jessica has added uh, uh, you know the ability for system builders to also use Eclipse because we've gotten some indication that Eclipse is actually getting a lot you know of popularity so you can actually go and edit your recipes in in Eclipse and there's you know support for all that in terms of a tree view and then boot up the hob and get it to do the build and so it's it's actually we're we're able to do a lot more now in Eclipse so it's it's a pretty good setup so good stuff coming um, so now what I want to do is I guess let me pause and sorry let me see if there are any questions here and I'm actually going to go into the how to so um, any questions on what I just had okay all right there'll be time for questions at the end I hope and I'll be around I'm here all week. So how does it work? I'm just going to give you kind of the quick start guide here. And uh, then I'm going to kind of give you the cook's tour through the kitchen a little bit and kind of show you how the different pieces work and how you can get access to some other great free electrons videos and other uh, presentations. that are. See, I'm trying to give you commercials, you know, any chance I get. I love what you guys do. It's phenomenal. So um, that's what we'll kind of go through here. So in one slide, this is how you build Linux. You basically go to the Octo Project site and, and uh, you know, Click on documentation and read our quick start guide. That will essentially give you the stuff that's in this slide, but we've got a quick start. Um, set up your Linux system. Typically, you know, a, a, a fairly current distribution of like a, a, a fairly current release of like a, a Fedora or uh, OpenSUSE or Ubuntu is, is, is the best. It's either the current version or the one previous. Those are the ones we're mostly testing on. So if it's Fedora 6, I have no guarantees. If it's uh, Arch Linux, I have no guarantees. If it's Fedora, you know, 15, I think we're in better shape. Okay, so um, just just you know, so you can understand. Um, if there there may be some packages you might need to get installed, uh, it's listed in the quick start. Uh, download the latest uh, stable release, uh, and that says Bernard. But actually, uh, the latest is Edison, and I forgot to make this change on the slides. The latest is uh, is the Edison uh, branch from the Git repo. There's a file called local.conf, and you'll set. There's a variable called machine, and this is actually where you set the architecture. Um, um, you know, uh, you know, we have QEMU support for emulation, um, so you can pick that or pick a 
real hardware model that we have there. Um, the number of threads in parallel may get you to set the parallelism level. For, uh, for a four core machine with, with eight hardware threads, I'd typically set those for, I'm kind of weird, I would probably set them for four and four and that gives you a fairly, that warms the sand up pretty good, you know, when you really get the build going, you know, the fans start kicking on, you know, that, you know, starts breathing hard, so I think that's pretty good. Um, there's a script to source, this OE init build in, and then you run bitbake, and uh, in this case I'm building core image Sato, that's a Sato is, uh, I think it's in Japanese, I think that's the word uh, sugar. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's a little demo uh, UI. It's nothing impressive, but it's one that was built on, on Yocto a while ago. Yeah? You should not use minus K. Don't use dash K. Okay. Dash K. Yeah? Because it means I will eat your kitty. I will eat your kitty. Yes, check the help for bit Okay. Minus dash K is... Uh, do build and if something break, never mind. You will not get what okay. Image. I only stuck in dash K here in this last version of the slides, and I was I think partly it's because oh I remember somebody had a a deal where one of the the uh, checksums didn't match on the sources, and so it's like anyway. Basically, basically dash K is an option if that if you are using it. Yeah. You you there are two options. You really know what it means. Yeah. You uh, are experimenting. Or you have absolutely no idea what it is for, and you want to chop it. Yeah. Okay, so so good point. Maybe not use a dash kit. Whatever the quick start guide says is probably a good thing to do. Uh, anyway, once you finish the bit bake, you will have downloaded a complete set of Linux sources. You've built yourself a running image. Um, so you can do the run QEMU is basically a little script that lets you run QEMU. In this case, I set machine to QEMU x86, and I you know, boot up basically an emulation so you can boot your Linux up. So in one slide, this is, you know, what it takes, you know, to, to build and, and run your own Linux system. So that's it. Uh, and as Jessica pointed out today in her talk, this is all done in the hob without, well, you still have to down, do some downloading to, you know, get the packages there and things like that. But basically, that's, that's pretty much all you have to do. So it's pretty simple. But now what I'd like to do is, is kind of show you a few of the bits and pieces underneath. Um, so everything in sort of the gray is what we call the Octo project, but it's really sort of an umbrella for, for various things. Um, Pocky is, a, is a, a pro, another open source project that we've basically brought under the Octo umbrella, and that's really the build system. There's uh, open embedded core, that's another, so each of these boxes represent other, you know, uh, projects. Open embedded core is a um, project with open embedded. Um, it's a common upstream of packages, and so it includes you know, metadata basically for those set of packages that are shared with the Open Embedded project. Um, BitBake is the uh, is the the basically the build utility. Um, there's documentation and a la layer called MediOcto. It's a fairly thin layer, but on top of OE Core, um, we have a few additional pieces that we've defined for the Octo project. So a few things that are special for the thing that we're building on top of the core, and then you know reference. BSP metadata. So in this case, um, we have a few BSPs that we're automatically building with the Octo project, and so there are a few pieces there that we have, uh, you know, one per architecture basically, so to, you know, sort of have our basic kind of design and QA effort, so um, we have, you know, essentially one each for the four architectures we support. There's some additional pieces, the, the application development toolkit, the Eclipse tools, uh, we have sudo, swabber, and embedded kernel tools, so there's a variety of other things outside of Pocky. We're going to be throwing some other things, for example, one of the things, uh, a, a bunch of engineers right now are working on a NAS. Uh, project, which is basically a network attached storage, which is an example sort of project based on the Octo tools, and so I would imagine that would come in there. It's mostly just as an example. Someone could use it and then take on to, to build other things as well, but, you know, various other projects we're, we're putting in. Um, and then these yellow things are things that are, you know, kind of results. We have some uh, reference uh, BSP uh, output, the actual, you know, bootable limit Linux image and shared state and some other things like that. So really, it's a you know the the idea is to try and provide a stable base for people to be able to you know build whatever it is that they want out of it. So then, how does it work? Yes, question. Uh, what about things like bootloaders? Do you guys are so familiar with that? You know. It, for bootloaders, um, you know, with ARM uh, U-boot and some other, you know, uh, bits and pieces there, um, typically the the it's really a BSP decision. We haven't rolled those up into the Octo project, but it's sort of more or less on a per BSP basis. 
you know, for the Intel things, I think UEFI typically is, is used for most of those. Um, so that's, yeah. Or some bootloader development kit, I think we've been working with them on that. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to show you how this works at a little bit deeper level. So everything I've showed you would be enough to actually be able to use the thing. I want to sign up, peel back the next level of detail. And if you want to go even deeper, um, down in the box, when you get the slides, I, I, I sent them in, so hopefully they're on the website by now, uh, that you can actually follow the URL and get to a more detailed presentation and video and things like that. So that's the reason I put those there. Um, so. I'm going to actually go kind of tour you around this really fancy, busy picture with lots of different colors, and I'm going to zoom in on different pieces and kind of show you how the different pieces work. Okay? So the first thing that happens is that, you know, over here on the left, we've got various configuration files. And um, I already told you about the local.conf file. You could, there's also a file called pocky.conf. This is, is, is configuring pocky, which is that, you know, kind of core. Um, it's, it's basically policy configuration. You could use, you know, define your own. But this is policies about, you know, how various things get put together in the, in the OS. Um, and then there's, there'll be various machine-specific variables under this machine directory. So here's an example here, Router Station Pro. That's a, uh, a MIPS-based, I think it's MIPS-based, is that right? I'm sure someone would know. I think so. Uh, basically, that's one of our, you know, reference BSPs. And so um, they're various machine-specific variables. So, you know, you've defined some things, basically. Um, there are, within local.conf, there's a variety of things that you can set. The, again, the parallelism. Uh, you can set uh, this extra image features is an example of, you know, groups of packages. So, for example, um, you could use this to define in, uh, you know, certain certain other features within the OS that you're building. Um, we also have this feature incompatible license. The idea behind this is every recipe in the system actually has a license associated with it. So, for example, if I'm talking about, you know, something that is a GPL v3 license, it'll actually sell, say what the license is in the recipe as and checksums the license as well. So, if it changes, basically the checksum will fail. Now, the powerful thing about this is some people in the embedded world, you know, mandate they don't want a GPLV, any GPLv3 components. So I can actually set this incompatible license and it will, the, the system will basically not allow any GPLv3 into the system. So it's a very nice way to, to build everything uh, without that license. And I, I'm, I'm only saying this because this is some people, what some people want. I'm not telling you this because I don't support the GPL or anything like that. I love the GPL, love, love all the versions. It's just this is a way because some people, you know, I have to say that just to, you know, so no one will throw a tomato at me or something. So, um, so anyway, there's a few things that you can set. Um, the other piece, uh, again, this comes with the project you're downloading all this metadata, is basically these recipes for building packages. Um, I threw in an example here, this uh, coreutils69.bb builds version 6.9 of the core utilities and installs them. That's basically what the recipe gives you instructions uh, for how to do. Um, we also include patches, patches and other, you know, extra files to install, etc. I think I give you an example. No, I, I don't actually... I think I have given you a little bit of an example later on, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch that a little bit later. Okay, so that's all that configuration. But, you know, we also have this, this idea of layers that comes in at this point, too. Now, what layers are are really just another kind of metadata, and it basically, um, what it'll, it's a very sort of um, configurable architecture. So the basic idea behind this is, you can kind of see at the lowest level we have OE core. I told you about that. It's the sort of the basic collection of metadata we have to work with. Um, we have meta Yocto, which is a Yocto-specific um, level of packages. And then you can kind of see how this works. You can have a BSP as a layer, um, some, maybe a UI specific layer. Maybe you want to develop something um, using uh, one of the various different UI frameworks we support. Today we have uh, Qt, uh, various versions of GNOME, GNOME Mobile, a um, uh, vari variety of other uh, UI specific things. There's even people that have a Java layer in there, various other uh, kinds of things that you can build into it. Um, a lot of people have a lot of ideas of other UI specific things that they want to put in. It's great. Um, then you can, maybe for an OSV, maybe they have their own layer, for example, that has some additional packages or maybe some additional, um, you know, uh, various other uh, bits that they want to include, right, services and whatnot. And then your own layer. For example, if you're creating a project, this NAS-specific project will just appear as a layer. And what the layers are really are as, um, uh, you know, it's just, essentially there's, there are other .bb files, which are these recipes. Um, you can take an existing BB 
file and make a change. It's something called a .bb append. So you can make changes, basically override various things. And uh, then whatever additional, so there are ways that you can turn off stuff. For example, you can have, you know, just say, I, I want to get rid of a bunch of stuff and do that in a layer. Or you can add additional things. And so it's a very, you know, powerful capability. By the way, if you don't like something in the Octo project, some thing, some decision that maybe the, the project has made in terms of a package, very easy to substitute that for your own in a layer. So you don't, you can take advantage of the rest of the stuff that the community is doing within the Octo project, but say, no, I prefer this way of doing things. Very easy to do that within a layer. Okay, so this is a good feature. Uh, I, I want to focus a little bit on these BSPs and show you a little bit about how this sort of stuff works. Um, the idea behind, a, you know, the, the idea here is very simple. I heard this just today. People are, are so, um, you know, frustrated sometimes because people talk about BSPs all the time, board support packages, and it's like, you know, the problem is that there's no kind of common format for them. So a lot of the people working with BSPs, they, they, they don't know, you know, what might be in it, and they just, you know, how do I work with this thing so I can make use of it, right? And so what we've tried to do is try to say maybe we can kind of standardize on sort of one form of BSP so that people don't have to, you know, struggle with whatever's there. And and basically the definition of the thing, um, you know, really is uh, the way we've kind of set it up is like a binary part and a source part. Binary part are, you know, whatever, you know, bits of, uh, um, you know, IP, for example, maybe there's some things that need to be binaries. Uh, and, and usually we put in a bootable Linux as well, so it's easy to boot it up and see that it works. Works. The source part are those, you know, recipes that, that are needed essentially in a layer to get it built with Yocto. And so it's a, you know, we're hoping that this will actually be something that will um, help advance, again, uh, again, Linux and embedded. Uh, you know, some a few examples in there that, that you can go and find once you download Yocto. So when you download Yocto and you take a look, you can see a lot more here. There's a great talk that uh, Tom Zanussi gave, um, pointers on the slide, so you can go download the talk and watch the video. I think it's, it, it's really helpful. It goes into a lot more detail about how exactly you could build your own BSP or edit one, an existing one, to do what it is you want. I, you know, for example, there's one of the projects out there, I remember there's something, this, this like tablet looking thing that's like running some grocery store automation demo on it. I mean, those guys basically, you know, did, built a BSP that included, we included Java in there and it included a bunch of other, you know, their, their user interface and stuff like that. I think I had Chromium in it and some stuff. So anyway, that's, that's an example for something that, that you can put it together in a BSP. Kernel development, one of the other advances that I think Yocto has done from a kernel development standpoint is um, added some tools that are supposed to really help sort of the workflow if you deal with different architectures, right? One of the challenges with working with the kernel and some of the embedded architectures is it's not always easy to, you know, just, you know, download something from kernel.org and always get it booting on your hardware. And there's there are various different, um, you know, uh, config collections of, of uh, options and patches and a variety of things like that. Um, the, the very powerful powerful set of tools are included in Yocto that um, essentially let you, uh, you know, pick the branches and pick the set of configuration files um, that will work with wh whatever, you know, hardware situation you're working on. So, um, you know, essentially uh, the, the win here is that there's less code duplication. You can implement one feature for, let's say it's, uh, you know, some particular option. You don't have to re-implement it for all the architectures. You just do it once and you can apply to all of them. Um, and there's a great talk. I am not an expert on the kernel tools. I'm not sure I'm an expert on anything, but from the standpoint of describing what the kernel tools do, I really suggest you go to the talk because I'm, I'm really not very good on that. But anyway, those are the pointers to those. Um, I, and uh, uh, the other thing I was going to mention here relative to the, uh, the some of the kernel tools, we actually have you know typically four kernel versions that we have in um, in Yocto at any one particular time. Uh, we have uh, what we call Linux Linux Yocto stable. This has been uh, 2634. Actually, with LTSI, I uh, participated in the kickoff of that project uh, yesterday and heard a lot of good things about LTSI. So that may be a way that you know our Linux Yocto stable maybe become the, the LTSI stable at some point. I don't know. We haven't quite worked that out as a project yet, but I think that might be a really good idea to really help people out on it. Um, we have, you know, 2637, 3.0. 3.0 is actually the, you know, I think it's 304 is what we've actually done, you know, the primary amount of validation and QA on. Um, and then we always have one, uh, you know, uh, Linux Korg, uh, which is basically the current 
you know, bleeding edge of what's ever in, in uh, Linux.git. It's really, it doesn't have a lot of support for it. It's really just there if you really want to do sort of, you know, kind of tip of the tree kind of development. Base minimum of tools that are there. Okay, so I've got all my configuration files set up. I've loaded whatever, I put all my layers in place that I want. What's the first thing that happens? Well, the first thing is we go and fetch sources. Um, the recipes really go out and tell you where to find all the sources. Built into Yocto, by the way, are backends which understand all the different source code systems. So it's got Git built in, it's got uh, SVN built in. In fact, there's a whole list here. It's uh, you can HTTP, you can just get a tarball, you can get things out of Mercurial, Good Night, CVS, all kinds of different things. So you can really, you know, it really has that support to kind of dig out of those projects, you know, the the, the source files basically to grab them. Um, but if, if for some reason the site is down, uh, that the project, you know, website, we have a source mirror, so you can default over to the source mirror to get those things. Um, you can either uh, fix the version of the sources, or you can actually have it change based on just what the latest is there's this um, source rev this auto rev feature basically says go and just get me the latest version of whatever it is that's for the adventurous uh, in the crowd but that's I'm sure that'll uh, you know the, anyway that that feature is there uh, and I mentioned the mirror so yeah so it goes through the first thing you know the very first thing that bitbake does is it reads all those configuration files and typically it reads through all the recipes builds this dependency database basically and that's by the way when it's parsing recipes is when the the CPU really heats up it's really very cool all, all of my you know meters turn to the top and it really has lots of parallelism. It's fantastic. But then the next thing it does is starts fetching these sources, right? And then once the sources are fetched, it, it also applies patches. Of course, it's doing this all in a very parallel sort of manner. Um, it's a good place to patch the software itself, yourself. Typically, the, the development model for Yocto is create a patch and that will um, get applied by Yocto, uh, you know, by the build process, basically by BitBake as you go through. Um, and try and contribute upstream whenever possible, we try to. And if you have some things that are broken, you need to patch, try to you know, submit those upstream to those projects. We think that's a good thing, right? And if it's something in Yocto, uh, absolutely. We strongly encourage you to send us patches on that stuff as well. Um, and then we go through the compile step. Okay, now here's where I have some examples, and I apologize that the font is a little bit small, but you can kind of take a look at this. But you can kind of see, this is what a recipe, typically a .bb file, will have in it. It'll have a description here. Um, it'll tell what the license here is. In, in this case, it's GPL v2 plus. Um, and as I said, checksums the license. And then has a, uh, a version number and then a source URI. In this case, um, it's gone on to basically uh, get a, a tarball. So it pull, it'll basically basically go to that, um, you know, uh, GNU mirror and pull down the uh, the tarball. And, uh, you know, you can set in the, here the C flags, basically, so you can set whatever optimization flags in the recipe itself. So if, you know, most of your, your recipes are fine with certain, you know, common sets of optimization, but there's one you want to optimize differently, you can basically set that in the recipe. Um, and then typically install, case, it, there's typically an install case in the recipe because sometimes you, you know, just a make install or what have you, uh, um, may or may not, you know, work for you. So you want to make sure you have the, in, the the install step there, and that's it. That's that's really what's in most recipes are kind of in this, you know, variations of this kind of uh, uh, form. Um, you'll notice here I also have inherit auto tools. Um, basically, then uh, it run, does all the normal, you know, uh, uh, auto tool sort of stuff in terms of of running that prior to make. And so basically, then just uh, you know, the thing just does everything automatically based on what you have there. And for vast majority of projects in the Intel, or sorry, in the, you know, not, not Intel, what are you, sorry. I, I jet lag is just obviously, you know, kicked my brain, sorry about that. But anything in the vast ecosystem of stuff that's, oh, that was the word, I mean, I used the word ecosystem, that's like, you know, my problem, okay. Anything in the vast, you know, world out there of software will, will work, most of the stuff will work this way. There are a few that are more complicated. Okay, now we go, once we've compiled everything, now we can, uh, you know, basically go through packaging. Sometimes there's a little bit of a religion about packaging in the Linux world. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. You know, some people really love uh, Deb and other people love RBM. And, uh, you know, we've, we've decided not to join the religious 
war, but just to be rather, uh, you know, non-denominational. So we'll support RPM or DEB or uh, iPackage, which is a sort of a very lightweight embedded packaging format. So we support all of them or any of them that you want to pick. Um, so we go through packaging. You can change it. There's a package underscore classes in the config file that you can change to the different packaging formats or use the hob very easily, you know, radio button, basically different package formats. And then uh, basically there's a step where we go through and, and then uh, uh, repackage stuff within and you can, you know, if you want to split into multiple packages, there's ways to do that very easily, and you set that up in the recipe. So your .bb file could have, here's an example where um, we have the packages split up in a couple, uh, you know, basically split things up in a couple of different packages, right? So very easy to work that stuff out. And then the, the last thing that we do here is image generation. And in this case, um, you know, you can create a live boot image, a root file system, uh, or a sysroot, uh, sysroot for app development. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit in a second. So yeah, um, basically, by the way, of course, with packaging, you created a set of package feeds. We use those package feeds to create the, the bootable image. Um, we can also, uh, you know, use those package feeds to create what we call an SDK, or this these application development tools. And the idea behind this is that um, we can, you know, build essentially, you know, your target image may not necessarily have a complete set of, you know, tools and whatever else in the in the image because maybe it's a, a, a smaller footprint sort of image. But you want to be able to have all those debug, you know, capabilities abilities available to you so we can actually create a uh, you know a bigger you know target image that actually has a bunch of the debug stuff in it um, and this these application development tools and uh, anyway so this bit bake command here shows you you know building a QEMU arm with uh, basically uh, building the this SDK version of the image and then building the tool chain out uh, so uh, you don't have to use QEMU by the way for the target architecture I'm just doing that in the example so let me actually talk a little bit more about this, the model that you use for application development. So for application development, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool because you, the images basically become a sysroot, right? That's your bootable Linux that you then can do your application development against. Um, the cross tools that you've created, basically you can install those. So you've built a complete set of cross tools as part of building Yocto, so you have those. And then you have the package repository. Those are the three key pieces you need for application development. So you can kind of see the package repository can either be local on the developer system or on a network someplace. And then you have the sysroot and the cross tools. Now what I've got is essentially things set up really nicely to do my develop my app development. Um, I also have the Eclipse plugins. I'm not going to talk about that very much today. Watch the great video, I'm sure, for Jessica's talk, as she did, gave a great set of demos. Or find Jessica. I, Jessica, I'm talking about you all the time because you're there, you know? So wave. See, everybody sees Jessica. She's the maintainer of the uh, application development tool. So uh, talk to her if you want to see an Eclipse uh, demo. I'm sure she would love to give everybody a demo uh, if you want one. So then once you've, you've got this thing set up, basically there's a, you can either do development on a device emulator, we use QEMU for all four architectures, um, and then you can use the sysroot that you've installed, uh, or you can install the image on your device under development, right? So um, a lot of times an app developer may not have the hardware to go run against, and so they're going to do all their development in QEMU, right? Um, and uh, by the way, that's the other nice thing about having everything cross so that, you know, maybe the native compile situation is not a great maybe it won't go very fast because it may be kind of small so you can do your development cross right have a very nice beefy system we really hope it's from Intel well I hope it's from Intel the project I mean they don't care I really hope it's from Intel but anyway a very nice beefy you know system to your development on and you then you can you know either develop against uh, QEMU or against your device under development and uh, the other uh, great feature here is that the when you're for either case, either QEMU or a real device, you can either either you know basically uh, for the device and development, obviously you might have some you know flash storage or some sort of storage for the for the image, or if it's got network support, you can just boot it using uh, NFS and then you know have that sysroot run over the network. So you can have either the, the cool thing about running it under NFS, of course, is that um, very easy to you know change the binary of one you know change one package or you know something and just jam that into the image and then you don't have to reflash the device or something if you're you know developing it right so this is a very nice you know model for doing development so uh, anyway so 
Uh, I kind of went through, you know, is like I said, sort of the cook's tour of all these things. Are, is there are there any questions about all these, you know, kind of details that I gave? I sort of flew through the kitchen very quickly, but you know, I sort of hopefully hopefully gave you an idea how how all the pieces work together. Yeah. Yeah, you also got a couple of questions uh, as far as the packaging. Pieces, yeah. I mean, how do you guys handle that? Packaging? Yeah. So uh, the question was, how do we handle? Packaging, package dependencies. Package dependencies, right. Right. And, you know, it's very hard to, very difficult. Yeah, I, I'm going to give you, okay, so you're asking how, how we uh, handle package dependency generation. I'm going to give you the answer. I'm going to parrot back what I've heard, but if 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 there's something wrong with the answer, Jessica is here to, to correct. You are you are going to correct me of any of these things I, I say, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, behind the scenes, so for example, if you pick RPM, um, behind the scenes it creates the spec files, basically, that are used to generate, you know, basically the RPM packages. So, that's all handled pretty much under the, you know, under the covers, and so you don't have to deal with spec files, but whatever in, independent whatever dependencies are there based on you know after the build system has built stuff it knows what the dependencies are so it can create them you can also manually create dependencies either runtime dependencies or compile time dependencies in in the recipe so e either way so if you know right that you need a package installed at runtime but you don't ne necessarily need it at compile time you can say r depends and and set up a package basically to be there basically at runtime does it know which kernel packages to select subsystems, oh, kernel, modules. kernel modules to select based on um, what's been, conf I, I, I think the answer is no. I see both Saul and Jessica back there. I don't think either one of them are, yes? I think the answer is no, yeah? Yeah. So, unfortunately, the the kernel maintainer couldn't it got deathly ill and couldn't come. So, I got the user land maintainer here, the application development maintainer, but. Yeah. I saw actually a hand back here. Yeah. The source mirror? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely has to be because, you know, we're creating some images basically to, to do testing validation against. And we also make them available as sort of a side effect on the project. Of course, we have to, to comply with licenses. We have to have all those sources there as well. So all the sources absolutely are, are open. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I suppose the, the previous question might have been targeting out of, uh, out of tree build uh, uh, modules. Oh, oh, out of tree modules. You know, um, you, yeah, you, you know, is Darren in the room? And I'm just not seeing him now, unfortunately. Uh, we got well, one of the kernel guys is here. I, you know, basically, he's the guy showing his. Uh, he's given the talk on fast, his fast and tiny and real time stuff today. Or I guess it's tomorrow. So, oh no, it's Friday. As long as kernel, as your out of kernel module doesn't require anything other than kernel headers. You just uh, set in recite uh, inherit module, and it will automatically depend on kernel, and we'll get uh, kernel headers. No, no, that was the uh, uh, other way around. Yeah, so the question I was actually asking, like, for example, if you open up your key, you select IP tables, it'll build the right, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll enable the right kernel. You know. So you're going the other way. You want to actually. <laughs> I think I think I got the idea you're talking about. I, I, I don't, I, I wish Richard was here. Well, basically, if you define IP tables, that will automatically bring in the kernel modules you need. Um, at this point, I'm going to, I was flashed the one minute sign, then she left again. So she's not here if I go a minute over. I got one more slide to show, but I did see a hand. Yes, go ahead. Correct. Yeah, 
Yeah, basically the, 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 the BSP format that we've set up allows you to have those sorts of things in there, whether device drivers or like crypto modules, a variety of other, you know, things, firmware, various things like that. So all that stuff, yeah, you can, you can put into a BSP. We may not host it on the Yocto Project Org site if it's not fully open source, because we're a Linux Foundation, you know, project, we want to make sure everything is, you know, clean and license uh, ready and all of that. By the way, I, I was going to say, one of the things that's interesting about this, because of all of our strong uh, connection with licenses, I mean, some of the people are uh, in the license, uh, the software, I'm going to get the name wrong, the software conservancy, no, that's not it. I, there's some of the licensed people who are looking at this and saying, wow, this is a great example of doing things right in terms of licensing, in terms of embedded. So there's actually a lot of interest in it. Okay, I'm going to flash through one or two things really quickly because they did give me the one minute. So I want to tell you what's next. So again, we just came out with our 1.1 release. We'll come out with another one in April. Um, some of the things, again, I really want to work on is kind of, uh, there are a few areas that are a little confusing. For example, I build a minimal image and it's a busy box based system, right? Well, if I want everything in minimal, but I want to switch the shell to bash, for example, I had this actually, H, H, uh, HPA uh, came up with this and it was like, and, and it turns out it's conceptually very simple if you know the concept, but it's, it's not exactly obvious. But little things like that, I want to actually find as many of these as I can and try and, you know, put them into hob and try and get them just as, you know, easy to pick, you know, that sort of stuff as much as possible. We're going to work on some of those things, continue to make it easier and easier so you don't have to figure this stuff out. And then, you know, try to um, isolate all Linux development system uncertainties. One of the challenges there is because it is a desktop build system, desktops can have various different things configured and screwed up and whatnot, not, not you know, perfect for the whoever's using it, but may not be perfect for Yocto. So again, I'm going to actually distill everything. I'm tired of people running into problems of one sort or another, so I want to distill everything into something that is guaranteed to work. And I just, you know, kind of make sure it's, it's just as bulletproof as possible. It's not a product. This is an open source project, but I feel like we can put a little effort on that and I think we'll be good. Um, how to get started. I strongly encourage you, download it today, give it a try. In fact, some of you may be downloading it right now. Maybe you've, you've got a build going already. Anybody started a build already? No, not yet. Um, you know, really, you know, make sure you read the quick start. Um, I recommend that you uh, build test on, uh, you know, QEMU or real hardware, you know, develop apps. One of the things we were hoping to do is give each of you in this session a free piece of hardware. And it turns out the hardware guy is building, I'm not a hardware guy, but they were, they were running into a few problems with the hardware. So uh, I'm suspecting at the next uh, Embedded Linux conference, uh, come and, you know, you may get a free piece of cool looking hardware that you can work on. So join the community and, and really contribute is what we'd recommend. And you can, you know, pound Yocto on free notes and we've got, or hash Yocto, depending on, you know, uh, what, what continent you're from. There's a Yocto mailing list. Really, uh, getting getting involved is easy, so we really urge you to get involved. If you want to join the organization, there's a, um, a way you can do it on the website. Go visit the website and you can actually uh, join and contribute and uh, get involved. We'd really love to have you involved. If you have other questions, I'd like to entertain them, but I, I think I need to clear the podium for the next poor, uh, poor sucker who's going to be up here. So thank you, Aon, very much for coming.